Before we get started, quick shout out to the newest patrons. Kate Dawson, Kodiak, Nomad, Left Coast, D. Reyes, and Christina Mum. Thank you all very much for subscribing to the Patreon. If you haven't already subscribed, over 50 exclusive episodes on there, only found on the Patreon. Make sure to check it out. www.patreon.com slash the one one podcast. Bye. Enjoy the show. And then we have Carla Ionescu again. The, the first episode we recorded should be out by the time this is out. And today we're going to be talking about a topic that makes my esoteric nipples hard. So serpent <laughs> worship. And we're going to get into it. Gabe, can you introduce yourself? And then we'll let Carla introduce herself. Yep. Yeah. My name is Gabe. I go by Slick Dissident. That is my YouTube channel name. I also weave with the Weaving Spiders Welcome Team on uh, Wednesday and Saturday nights. So you can catch me at the Weaving Spiders Welcome. Uh, also, we also have another alias, the Weaving Spiders Webs. Uh, sometimes we have to jump onto that other alias. And uh, you can also catch me on Interverse with Chance Garten over on the Rockfin. And uh, on Wednesdays, he goes by the uh, Vibrant is our Wednesday program. So that's where I'm at. Yeah, we, sh- we should get Carla on there one day. We got to talk to Chance. <laughs> totally. totally can you introduce that yourself like and share your book carla where people can buy All it right. I'll post on the description as well okay yeah so my name is carla Ionescu. i go by artemis expert across the media i actually have my book right here look at that i love that the way they did that design i didn't do this but it was so cool <laughs> uh <laughs> i wrote the book she who hunts about artemis and i have a podcast called the goddess project uh which uh i'm gonna use so that we can talk about snakes and serpent culture today my phd is in ancient history and mythology um i call myself an ancient historian but i'm starting to call myself a mythologist lately because i feel like that fits better um in academia you know you got to kind of position yourself like where which stream you're going to teach and discipline and so i'm usually the ancient historian or history uh discipline but i think in like in life and in conversations, I think mythologist is probably better. Yeah, since that has been my passion. So, yeah, that's who I am. Awesome, yeah. And I encourage people to check out her YouTube channel. She's got really, a lot of great material on there, her podcast. And she just, it's a wealth of information. And again, I don't, you know, I don't have people on who I don't enjoy their stuff. So there it is. And today we're going to be talking about, hopefully I say this right, Ophiolatria, which is the wor- the worship of serpents. Now, I want to set mm-hmm. this up. Because my research when I was doing it, you know, led me a a bunch of different ways. And what Gabe was talking about, I love when I'm listening to something of somebody's, like when I was listening to your show today, Carla, 
mm-hmm. it completed other research that I was doing at the same time while I was listening to your show, while I was doing whatever I had to do. And so it completed this other leg of, of something that I was like kind of blurry about. And then you brought it up and it's like, you explain what it was. And I was like, Oh shit, there it is. Oh. That's why it's like that. So I want to get, we know we talk about serpents. We talk about lizards. We talk about the lizard people, the, the reptilians and all this stuff. And it's kind of the same thing. It's been blurred in and out of history. In the Bible, it says, be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So we have wor- a serpent worship in Asia, Africa, Europe, and the Americas. The Hopi tribe had the snake clan, which was a shape-shifting people. They would dress up as snakes and turn into snakes. There's stories about that. The aboriginals had the Ningtaka, which is a humanoid lizard. The Buddha interacted with the Nagas. Uh, a lot of times they protected him and they would show him they would they were the symbol of enlightenment you have david ike and the zulu shaman that revealed the Chitu- chitauri which is like a reptilian uh humanoid race of beings that control the universe and then i have the chinese have dragons which is a sort of serpent at the same time in their own way and obviously we have the serpent in the garden of eden which can symbolize a lot of different things. It could be, some say it's Sophia, others say it was Satan. I have to disagree with that one because Satan wasn't even in in the dictionary until thousands of years later. And the other day, my wife is still in pains of the C-section. And she was like, man, you know, why is it that men don't have to suffer? And I was like, hey, why don't you blame your girl Eve when she took <laughs> out the... No, you did not. <laughs> I Juan. swear no, I said you that. you did not. <laughs> I said, why don't you hit your girl Eve up? Because she was the one that ate of the forbidden fruit (laughs) when she wasn't supposed to. Because if it wasn't for her, we wouldn't be here right now. So, you know, we'd still be in that garden. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I I had to do it because it was. was, (laughs) And she was like, you know, people twist the the Bible in their own way when they need to. I was like, hey, I mean, you you asked for it. So here we are. And. So this idea of the serpent has been, you have Kundalini, the Mm -hmm. coiled serpent energy and uh, the seven chakras. And it's supposed to, it's supposed to start a biological change within you when your Kundalini is activated. And they say to make sure not to do it by yourself and do it under the supervision of a professional, right? So we have Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent. Some say that's that's symbolic of the spinal cord, right? The feathered serpent. So I wanted to get into here. I have something where I found very interesting. And the the thing, the the research that you completed for me while I was listening to your show, Carla, was I'm very fond of the Gnostics. Okay, I studied mm-hmm. the Gnostics. And the Gnosticism is a blanket term. Like it's it's there's so many, you know, in ancient there was like 50 sects of ancient Gnostics. But in particular, the Ophite Gnostics, they regarded the serpent over Christ. And I'm quote, I'm quoting, they extolled the serpent and preferred it to Christ. And that's a pseudo-Tertullian text. And Tertullian is the founder of Western theology. And these individuals, they used the serpent in their Eucharist. They would Mm. let the serpent crawl over their altar. They would kiss the serpent. They would caress it. They would do various things with the serpent, which I found very interesting. Hippolytus, which is one of the most important, important theologists of the second and third century, but they don't really know who he is. It's like, hey, this guy is really important. He was a prolific writer, apologist of, of the church and everything. Well, we don't really know who he truly was. So... We have this guy who the first serpent worshiping sect of Gnosticism, he named them in one of his writings, the the Nicenes. And uh, they were regarded as the first actual Gnostics that when they were, you know, when Gnosticism was a thing, they were the first ones that were uh, regarded as Gnostics, simply Gnostics. And they also, they alone have sounded the depths of knowledge is what he said. And the, I found it very interesting because this is going to connect to what we've been talking about, Greek mythology and all this stuff, because they regarded the first man 
to have three there he was threefold in nature material psychic and spiritual and they regarded the serpent as the moist essence which i found made me feel uncomfortable when i read that so the, word, <laughs> the, the word moist makes me feel weird so i was like the moist <laughs> essence okay so they regarded the first man as and hopefully i'm saying this right and correct me if i'm wrong garyon the giant the the son mm. the grand i believe he's the grandson of medusa and that's right on the last episode we talked about medusa and med usa that gabe brought that up and here we are because we set that up we talked about artemis with the artemis expert and everything that she symbolized and her cult mm -hmm. and her their practices and i wanted to lead this and segue it into the serpent worship because it is a thing and i know you did your piece on medusa you have gabe with his information and yeah but i wanted to connect that there because i was like wow that's really interesting like out of all the people it had to be this three-headed giant right and it reminds mm -hmm. me of the earlier paintings of jesus when he was painted with three heads there's early depictions of jesus with three heads because they didn't know how to portray the trinity mm. it's like that's i was the, just thinking that that's the most that's the most complicated part of christianity the trinity is the hardest concept for people to grasp and yes. painters were like hey i don't want to just draw jesus he is the father the son and the holy spirit so let's draw him with three heads and it's fucking creepy the way that they drew him because again he looks like like a monster i mean it looks like like one of those like a like a hindu god or something you know with the different heads around his head so mm -hmm. so here we are and, and again the episode that caught my eye was snake goddesses mothers oracles and prophets so yeah where do you guys want to take this because i i I, I, got, I, I got a I got a whole lot to just kind of <laughs> fill in the what a lot of what you just laid forward. Um, so Nagas is the uh, it's both Hindu and Hebrew. Mm -hmm. So it's Nakash in Hebrew, it's Nagas in Hindu, and this is the bridge. This is the connection of the two cultures. Is the fact that they use this uh, essentially the very same word. Uh, to describe this wisdom, this this spirit of wisdom and knowing, and uh, in in my assessment and in my path, I have come to find that that word itself encodes the Holy Trinity of alchemy. N A is salt. H G is mercury, and S is sulfur. So the Nagas encodes the salt, mercury, and sulfur. And if you think about a serpent, a two-dimensional, uh, a line, a ray, the first line you draw on a piece of paper, you start at one end and you end at the other to connect two dots. That is a serpent. And it begins with salt. It binds with mercury, the messenger, and it ends with sulfur at the end. And so that's something, the Holy Trinity, that's very... Uh, very in, integral to our language and to understanding bridging old cultures and their connection to where we are now. And another element that was in my mind as you were speaking there, Juan, is the fact that we, we left an old calendar behind, mm -hmm. the three-season calendar. It is the C, which is the number three, and suns. See, sons, we used to have a three-seasoned calendar. That would be the three heads of the Christ or the three-part crown. This is all kind of going back to the sacred uh, value of the number three. And we took that three, that yod, the Y shape, which Y is a gamma, which is the old third letter of the alphabet in Greek, gamma, uh, which is gemel in Hebrew, so we took the three, the yod shape, and we superimposed that Y. You put it on a cross, a four-point Coptic cross, and you get Jesus, the Y shape of Jesus, hanging on a four-point cross. The brazen serpent. So the crucifix itself is encoding the old three-part uh, fasty calendar, 
and putting it on top of this four point uh, cross that we use that now we have four seasons. Wow. And there is a lot of alchemical mystery behind the three to the four, the D to the C. I have uh, you, you, tribute mentioned, and you mentioned Hebrew there for a second, right? Is it Nakash? And yeah. I came across this book. The Worship of the Serpent by John Bathurst Dean, 1833. And one of the things that he says in there that caught my eye when I was looking through this, because it talks about the Chaldeans being some of the first people to worship sa- uh, Satan, to worship the serpent. <laughs> <laughs> so it says here, from the Chaldeans, we are told that the Hebrews obtained the word Abaddon as a title of the Prince of Darkness. This word may... S- signify the serpent lord Hanius cited Brian makes Abaddon to be the same as the Grecian python it is not to be doubted that the Pythian Apollo is the evil spirit whom the Hebrews called Ob and Abaddon the Hellenist Apollyon and the other Greeks Apollo this is corroborated by the testimony of Saint John who says they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew tongues is Abaddon, but in the Greek Hellenistic tongue hath his name Apollyon. This same angel of the bottomless pit is in another place called the by the evangelist the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. So I found that really interesting because you're seeing here where they're borrowing from each other. Because I, I spoke to a theologian yesterday, Dr. Lumpkin, and he has written numerous books on church history and the watchers, the Nephilim and all this stuff. And he, and we were talking about the evolution of, of religion and how everything is cross pollinated. Right. So we see the same figure with different names all throughout history. Were they the actual same figures continually or were there multiple beings? You know, there was 200 watchers that fell, you know, so in, in According to Mr. Lumpkin, he says that they're still here, you know, that they're still trying to withhold man from becoming like Enoch did, a Metatron, this overseer of reality. And uh, one of the laws of thermodynamics is energy cannot be created nor destroyed. It can only be transformed. So when El or Yahweh or God or whoever destroyed all the all the Nephilim and all the 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 chimeras that were here, their spirits we're st- are still on this earth and that's how we get demons and evil spirits that are trying to what, withhold man from doing certain things that's why you see demonic possession and things of that nature so it's a very interesting take on it which i loved and i see you know i'm, I'm seeing here all these different you know you got the dragon you have the serpent you have all the same thing which is you know the name of the national god bell is supposed to signify nothing more than lord and was also sometimes appropriated to Deified heroes. It is more probable an abbreviation of Obel, the serpent god. The Greek, the Greeks remarks, Bryant, I don't know, this guy's Bryant's a historian or somebody, called him Belire, which is singular singularly interpreted by I can't say that word to signify dragon and the or the great serpent. And Belire is like a like the devil. I mean, you know, he's the he's another name for the devil, a demon. So Again, we have this evolution of another thing was that we talked about yesterday was how the feminine gets pushed out throughout all of this, where the the feminine withers away because all the gods of old were mostly androgynous and they were both male and female. You have the Chinese gods, which was both male and female, and they create mankind. But then you start to get uh, how you mentioned, Carla, in your in your lecture, where in the Old Testament, the story of Genesis, it's a guy, a guy and a guy, a dude and a dude making a chick. It's like, right. what are you saying? It's like, how do you know, even know what a woman is? Right. OK, so oh, you guys are saying so many things that I, I would love to to comment on okay so one of the first things i think that we're talking about all of us is like a kind of chronological timeline so 
when we talk about the Bible or the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, I find that that is so late, right? Like that is late in human history, especially in serpent worship. And it's also politically biased in getting rid of the serpent altogether. Uh, I know it's not Satan yet, but it's not viewed as sort of, you know, the, uh, the serpent is punished by being made to crawl on the floor like a snake. So, and I always wonder if the implication here was that it had legs and lots of scholars argue that perhaps it was more like a dragon than, um, than, than a serpent. Yeah. And so I think that I wonder if the serpent religion is not the original tr- religion. I mean, they found a Python cave in South Africa that's 8,000 years old. And so I, I wonder, you know, when we talk about how the serpent has become Satan and so much Satan, 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 I wonder if, and I mean, this is a very complicated and complex timeline, but I wonder if at some point those in charge created, and I'm not, actually I'm not wondering that, that's what happened, created the serpent as a bad thing or a negative thing or a demon. And, and so the masses were taught, don't worship the serpent, it's bad. And they were taught, worship someone else, whoever. And the sort of authorities maintained a type of serpent worship in which they almost had primary contact with the original old gods and therefore could do things like manifest or could do things like higher vibrations and, and secret knowledge and all these kinds of things. I mean, it's kind of fascinating when you think about the time that it took and the effort that it took to bash the serpent um you know what why i mean yes they took some time to bash the goddesses as well and they took some time to do a few other things but the serpent is so foundational uh and intrinsic as a symbol to us right um and yet like you said it still bleeds into the jesus worship it's like right it's like it's like we can't it's like human beings can't really let it go and the fact that you know nehushtan like we talked about or like i talked about in the podcast was actually a serpent that God made for Moses to protect the Hebrews, tells us that actually Yahweh then, no matter how much he punished the serpent of Eden, used the serpent to protect his own people. Like, weird, right? Um, And then, you know, it became this, yeah, it's, it's a weird, it's almost like the authors themselves couldn't let go of the power of that serpent imagery. And so in a way, perhaps they took it away from the goddess and appropriated it maybe to Moses, you know, uh, you know, uh, but certainly they, yeah, in a way, actually, now that I think about it, I think they did do that. They did appropriate it to Moses and sort of became again, a male symbol of power now. Right. And became like, Yahweh is now able to create the serpent that protects, of course, the Hebrews, and then it becomes the symbol of power and and protection, interestingly. Um, And then, of course, Jesus on the cross literally represents that serpent on the cross. And so, in a way, Jesus inherits serpent powers. I mean, if you said that 200 years ago, you'd be burned at the stake, right? I mean, that's blasphemy to imagine something like that. But clearly, there's a connection. And Jesus himself says in the Bible, right? What was that quote in John 3, right? Uh, it was uh, Matthew 10, 13, I believe, 10, 16. Oh, you got Matthew 10. So I've got John 3. So maybe he says it twice. I got John 3, 14 to 16, where he says, um, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, oh. even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That one. That's so, a different one, yeah. Oh, okay. And he says that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So whoever believeth in the son of man, which equals the servant serpent shall have eternal life for God. So loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, blah, blah, blah. And so here to me, when I first read that, when I was doing the podcast, I was thinking, so did Jesus have eternal life to the serpent? Uh, or because he says, as Moses lifted the per- serpent, so does God lift his son. I mean, it's a very interesting parallel there, right? I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, he fucked there's that a one lot. Up. He, he, yeah, I don't think he was a... really thinking about that one too much. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot, you know. Now, you know, again, like then we have to take into consideration who wrote this text, you know, like John, for example. Uh, traditionally in academia, we don't think that John actually, or a person named John actually wrote this text. 
it's certainly much too old to be John that was a brother of Jesus but just a hundred years later. Carla, you have to believe. <laughs> I actually went to the place where John took uh, Mary in Ephesus and uh, where it said that she died there. And a part of me can believe that John, her son, took her after Jesus' crucifixion to escape and go to Ephesus. But I, unless this John lived to be 130, um, I'm not convinced that he wrote the book of John. Uh, but whatever, that may be for another, another time. But he puts these words, you know, in Jesus' mouth. Because, again, we don't know what Jesus said because we only know what so-and-so said Jesus said. So. But still fascinating, if you think about it, because the serpent must have been in the mind of the writer and the audience to understand that reference and to make that connection. Yeah. So serpent worship, I think, is a... And now, if you think about it, when we even say serpent worship, people go, oh, you're going to be talking about devil worship, right? Or Satan worship. It's so automatic. When I ask my students, what does the serpent in the garden represent? Half the class the Christian half, but even the others will lift their hands and say, the devil. And then I literally will do a close reading with them, and I'll, I'll say to them, please show me where the devil is. Right? Because then we're just reading the text. It's not my word. It's not your word. It's just the text. You show me where the devil is in that text. And of course, there's no devil. Right? There's no. And my favorite thing, Juan, now that you talk about Eve, is that Eve is standing there taking the fruit, you know, eats it. And then there's a line that says, and she gave it to her husband who was standing right there, and he ate it, right? So he's standing right there, Juan. He's standing right there. Not once does he go, yo, you know what? I <laughs> not to do that. That serpent looks kind of <laughs> sus to me. You think we should probably eat this? <laughs> or at least, at least if Eve had it, he could have been like, yeah, you know, that's good for you, but I'm going to stay in my lane. <laughs> I'm mm-hmm. not going to eat that. I'm not going to eat that. God said no, but he just eats it. Yeah, he just takes it and eats it. I like the right? I like the Gnostic cosmology when it comes to the the Garden of Eden story where Yahweh is depicted as an eagle and Sophia mm-hmm. is depicted as the serpent. Sophia being mm-hmm. wisdom, Sophia being the mother of the demiurge Yaldabaoth, which again, the lion headed serpent. So he modeled this creature after himself it was an abomination that she gave birth to without consent of the one the source the masculine and in this in this parallel in this story this allegory you have yahweh as the as the eagle and sophia as the serpent and you see this eagle symbology all throughout even today it's on our doll it's on our money it's on our it's on our seal you see the Mexican flag, what does that have? It has the ser- the eagle eating the serpent. So mm-hmm. the reason that the Demiurge didn't want Eve, Adam and Eve to take from the tree of knowledge so that they wouldn't know and become aware that they were in- entrapped in this false matrix. And that's why he got so mad because they have become like one of us, like the Demiurge and his cronies. He had a bunch, he had a posse of demons that, that they were like, hey, let's, you know, now you have all this power. You know, you're still, you have the divine spark. You mm-hmm. are a lesser God, but you still have power. Let's make something for us. And that's he mm-hmm. created. That's how he created Adam and Eve. And you see this, the eagle glorified all throughout the rest of history. It's like, again, and that's what people call the inversion where, mm-hmm. you know, as above, so below, where the, the serpent was actually the good one. But all throughout history you ask anybody now on the on the street and they'll tell you well the serpent is bad oh you're you're a fucking snake you know you're Mm -hmm. you sneaky snake like you know we're Mm -hmm. led to again there are lost years of jesus life where there are many stories Mm -hmm. as to what he did where he went and he i mean i was i was raised pentecostal christian the laying on hands right the right you talked about the reiki where that Mm -hmm. is something that he was potentially using maybe he was using esoteric teachings of other mystery schools of his time to practice it you know what i mean one one of the things that blew my mind i had on a a friend of mine who is an he's a he's an eye doctor 
and he's an ocular disease specialist. So he specializes in the disease of, of the eyeball and everything. He says, I can tell anyone's health from just looking at their eye. Okay. He says when Jesus would heal the blind, right. And he would what spit on the dirt and rub it in their eye. Well, it was probably, he was using an abrasive material on top of the eye. It was clearing away the cataracts of people. Right. Mm. But people take, Oh, it was a miracle. He, he, you know, the blind, I want to know. I want the list of people that he didn't fucking hear. I wonder how long that one is like, Hey, where's the list of the people that maybe mal, mal is that holy malpractice? Like what's going on? Like, Hey, what's up, dude? I'm still feeling the same. I mm -hmm, still, mm -hmm. I still, I'm still sick. Like, you know, I just keep, keep going, bro. Just fucking move along. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so again, we're, we're led in a way to, you know, the, the, the construction of religion itself is a business for control, for power. If people mm -hmm. really understood how many times all these schisms throughout the history of the church, they literally were fighting over which bread to use at the Eucharist. Okay. They literally had wars over which bread that they wanted to use for the Eucharist. Let that sink in. Okay. They were fighting over bread. This is history. You can look this shit up and people don't understand that. And they take it for literal. So again, yeah. I think it's been done by design, this perversion of the serpent. And I think how you mentioned on your, on your episode as well, Carlo, where you said that the Holy Grail might not be, you know, the blood of Christ. It might be the elixir of life which could be the venom of the serpent i mean that's mm -hmm. also another possibility so and it's very interesting to think about yeah i think that there's and there's i mean there's so much in there in the sense that well the thing that you're talking about where the they're being birthed where where you're talking about how androgynous figures are birthing so that's that's an old tradition that the greeks then termed uh, parthenogenesis mm -hmm. and the idea was that uh, females, divinities, although I, who's to say whether they were androgynous or not, could self uh, impregnate. Well, it leads okay. back to the serpent because the serpent doesn't need a, 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 a male to reproduce. The serpent That's right. can produce on its own. So you get the divine feminine aspect, which again, it's related to Artemis as well. I believe she was also, well, what's mm -hmm. the word? Parthenogenetic. Yeah, I mean, there's a tradition that all goddesses that like sort of pre patriarchy, if we can term it that had the ability because I think pre -patri pre patriarchy, I mean, and sort of archaic history, I don't think that the ancients thought quite of goddesses the way we we really um, humanize divinities, we were really in that. Hu so for them, I think that they Later on, they started as they started sculpting them and depicting them. But you know, in the early early cave art, I mean, goddesses were basically a triangle, <laughs> or they were sort of a voluptuous shape that was sort of again ambiguous. So for them, I don't think that the goddesses are quite as literal as we take them today. Um, and so they could imagine almost it's almost like a cosmic situation where from nothing comes something, or from Earth comes something, or whatever. And so I, I, I could totally see how they imagined that this supernatural figure or divinity could burst something out of nothing. I think today when we talk about it, it becomes really gendered. And then it's like, oh, are you trying to say that we don't need men? Or are you trying to, you know, it's, it becomes really like political in a way. But I don't think the ancients thought like that. You know, it wasn't, no. you know, they weren't expecting women in their tribe to just... The ancients didn't want to be bad bitches, Carla. They didn't, they didn't want to. I don't need they no men. They were bad bitches. <laughs> <laughs> they were bad bitches, you know. But I don't think I don't think paternity mattered because we didn't have land, right? Paternity only started mattering when we had land and cities and civilization, right? Um, before that assuming based on scholarship women and men and tribes multiplied as they thought fit and they lived in communal homes and they shared communal children and mm -hmm. there was no need for paternity because like who cares there was really nothing to leave to your child you didn't have to confirm you didn't have to go on mori and do a dna test right <laughs> yeah. um right it wasn't a big issue so and so in a way i think that Again, see if you if you imagine yourself growing up in that culture, you can then imagine yourself believing in a goddess that just self 
creates because why not right, right. there's no need for a father it doesn't it I, like i said it wasn't so politicized right there was no need for like this power oh I, and this is what i'm saying about yahweh that you mentioned where yahweh is creating eve Yahweh and Adam are sitting. So Yahweh creates all these things from his thoughts, all these things from his thoughts, and then he creates Eve. And I'm like, how did you know how to put that together? Because there's doctors today who still can't figure out the female body. And, you know. What's the whole thing today? What is a woman? That's the that's the whole yeah. thing today. <laughs> you can't right? define a woman. Right. <laughs> like, right. What? You know, and and I understand this is a divine being, so you know perhaps he had other knowledge, but it's it's an interesting concept that these two dudes are creating this this female, and then that she is tasked with the creation of the rest of the world. It's kind of gay, if you so ask me. I mean, <laughs> it's I, like it's like why didn't Adam then be tasked with the creation of the world? Uh-huh. Right, so, like so one one thing that is going under the radar for a lot of people is the fact that these scribes that wrote these stories were deeply into numerology mm, and I love the, numerology yes and the actual nature of the these stories are rooted in numerological truth in a major way and i think it goes underappreciated and i have a uh, let me do a screen share here. I'm going to share. Let me know when you're going to pull that up so I can, because I have, I have you guys on big screen, so I can't see the, there we go. Okay. I'm ready if you're ready. All right. Here goes nothing. So this is the Hebrew symbol for uh, Tet. And it is also uh, nine. This is the serpent. Uh, you can see the shape of it. It's very serpentine. And nine has very interesting um, uh, effects in numerology. It Any number that you add to nine, like four plus nine, it, has, it disappears. Uh, it becomes 13, and you add the one and the three, it becomes a four. It's as though you did nothing. So it's self-absorbed. The serpent eats itself. It's self-consuming. So when you use a serpent in numerology, when you use the number nine, it disappears. It vanishes. It alchemically uh, uh, removes itself. And that is very interesting to me. Um, it, It has that kind of sneaky unnaturalness to it, you could say. And something happens... When let me see, I'm gonna scan here. Can you see this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So this is what happens when two nines get together. You can see the shape of the yin yang is actually two nines interlocking. It's called sixty nine, Gabe. Sixty nine. <laughs> well, sixty nine. You got it. So that's really in- fascinating. That's yeah. That's really interesting, Gabe. Very interesting. Yes. So uh, like you were saying, Juan, when you were talking about, um, you know, Jesus was using uh, forms of magic that, uh, or forms of healing that might have been Eastern oriented. Well, sure enough, when you take the two nines and you put them together, you get the quintessential symbol for Eastern mysticism, the yin and the yang. Mm-hmm. And so I, I uh, have a lot of of thoughts about how these myths overlay onto the nature of numbers. And um, another very crucial aspect of what we just talked about is in the Enneagram. In the Enneagram is a neat way. This is a project that's in the works. So a lot of this, these notes on top are not, pertinent to the conversation, but you'll notice the nine is at the tippy top. It's at the pinnacle. It's at the top of the three, six, nine triangle here. And that makes me think very much of Moses putting a serpent on the top of a staff. The nine is at the top of this Enneagram and the Enneagram can be used for good or for bad in many ways. It is absolutely a double-edged sword. Um, But I just wanted to kind of put those ingredients forward that while we're talking about the serpent, we should keep in mind the significance of that nine, both in numerology uh, and in uh, 
the Enneagram system. Um, and I want to also point out that the nine could represent Medusa as the head, being at the, the top, the head, and removing the head uh, could be part of the symbology of the Medusa mythology in a major way. And even you could even say that wrapping your head around the Enneagram is a form of subduing the serpent, being a, becoming the master of, uh, apprehending. Perseus is apprehending the serpent, or Medusa's head. He's apprehending her. He's got her in his hand. Uh, so all of those, to me, speak to uh, occulted numerological messages in the myths. Uh, so there's a lot more to unfurl, but that was kind of a, a surface peek at where my thoughts are on the nine representing the snake. Me, yeah, and uh, I, I, sorry, Duan, sorry. No, go ahead. Go I ahead. wonder, I was just thinking when you said that of, of the uh, Ouroboros sign, right? I mean, and I wonder how that, because that's some sort of alchemy symbol as well. It's circular in the same way. The snake is mm-hmm. eating its tail. It's not two snakes, which is interesting, but still, yep. that's a really interesting connection as well, right? So I'm thinking about Medusa gets down with uh, Neptune mm-hmm. in, in Athena's temple. That's the trident of Neptune. And then she finds out she's pregnant. That's the six. And she mm-hmm. flies away when uh, she looks in the mirror to realize she's pregnant. She, uh, it dawns on her in the morning while she's grooming. So she's looking at her reflective self. Six and nine are reflections of each other. And so she goes through this fearful response and fly, uh, she grows wings and flies and follows her instinct trusts in the gods to take her on the winds, and she flies away into uh, a remote location to be alone and so and be and uh, complete her metamorphosis and realize what she's become. And so I believe that uh, that is embodied in the 369 in a very interesting way. Uh, just some thoughts. We have Plato with his, uh, Plato's Lambda, but before we talk about Plato, we talk about Nikola Tesla where he said the secrets of the universe is three, six, and nine. We have the Tetractus, uh, very similar to the, to Plato's Lambda. It's it's modeled after the the Pythagorean Tetractus, Uh, but it also has this number of three, six, and nine in there. The Ennead is the number of limitation, and this is Pythagorean thought. Uh, It's the number nine is the inverted six, how you're saying. And number nine is the number of limitation because it falls short. Ten being the the perfect one, the 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 the, the godhead, if you will. Man is nine twelfths of a circle, or nine months in the womb. The nine looks like the sperm, right? Uh, there's nine symbolic months, and they call man is the creature that has fallen short because he could he will never reach that. It, uh, the number 10, Hercules was a 10-month baby, according to the to the legends. The Greeks believed the human brain was also a 9 twelfths of a circle. And according to the Eleusinian mysteries, it was the number of the spheres through which the consciousness passed on its way to birth. Because of its close resemblance to the spermat- uh, spermatosa, the 9 has been associated with germinal life. And if you look at the number 6, the hexad, which is harmony... There's a bunch of symbolism in there. So the Pythagoreans, the hexad was called the number of harmony, balance, motion. It's attributed to motion. So three, the triad, wisdom. Six, the hexad, harmony. And then nine, then you had limitation. That's like an alchemical trinity there. I I, I don't, I'm not sure, uh, you know, what they were trying to get at. But they, all these numbers were sacred to to the pythagoreans i mean all all is number you know the matrix the number is coming down on the screen so again back to this topic of the serpent do you is, is there any chance that okay so we're talking about the divine feminine we're talking about uh Femi, de, nine. Femi nine, right we're talking about that and we're also i, I don't know if it was you that brought it up carla but 
this idea of the serpent, because you talked about there being something before this worship started, right? Something before. We don't know. The oldest piece of literature we have is the Epic of Gilgamesh. Whatever else happened, you know, the, the Library of Alexandria probably held the secret if it was an actual real place or not. But Carl Jung talks about it being an archetype because a child will roll up Plato in the shape of, you know, a long tube without knowing what a serpent looks like and subconsciously does it. So perhaps these things are, you know, and literally intertwined in our DNA, the Caduceus, Hermes, Mercury, back to mm -hmm. alchemy. Is it actually the divine feminine or could it be taken as the phallic symbol? Because we, that is also part of these mythologies. Look at the story of Osiris and Set where the one missing piece was the dick. And that's why we have all these obelisks. Um, I don't know. I, I think hmm, I lean towards it being a feminine symbol, although I am not opposed to the idea that it also, because it so visually implies a phallic symbol as well. I don't think those two things are exclusive. Again, because... Uh, early let's and we're talking pre-greek culture so we're way up before osiris but i think because early cultures had a totally com totally different matrix of belief than we do and so for them i think two things could be simultaneously the same but i think what makes the snake particularly attached to the feminine and the reason why i believe that is because there we have so many uh, snake priestesses, so many. We have them in Crete. We have them. We have the Pythia. We have them all over the world, and we have them in different parts of Africa. We have them in early, you know, indigenous culture. So there is, there seems to be a bond between the snake and and the woman. There seems to be a, a kind of almost attachment in the sense that the snake literally attaches itself to her whether it's her arm, whether it's her body. In the case of Medusa, it's part of her hair. Um, in the case of Isis, it's right on her third eye. Mm -hmm. um, so there's like a literal physical attachment to the feminine or the divine feminine and the snake. And so usually males are depicted in the ancient world more as bulls, right? Like there's a much more mm. bullish figure. Um, there's a much, and that's, that's a fertility masculine powerhouse kind of symbols. Um, and so, or, or bison, like usually when we're talking about male depiction, it's usually a powerful animal. Again, I'm not discounting the fact that this is could easily be a phallic symbol, but I just see it in, in so much a literal attachment to the feminine. Um, and there seems to be almost like a mother child bond between it or like a secret. And I think this is why it talks to Eve. There's no accident. It talks to Eve in the garden because that would have been a, re a primary relationship right? There's a connection there. There's familiarity there. Um, also why I think Adam doesn't say anything because there's almost like this is women's business, <laughs> right? Like, you know what I'm saying? This is, this is for them to figure out. Um, and so, and so I think that originally there was this connection perhaps because life, women's bodies were seen as sort of the gateways between life and death and snakes are, especially the Ouroboros, for example, but other, symbols of the snake are life and death as well and so there's a lot of multi-layered connections there i think between and so i do think that initially the snake was associated with the divine uh, feminine but then i think it was so powerful that as like i said as patriarchy and, and uh, patrimony and all these p words came up <laughs> they re they recognize the power of the snake and they and 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 the actual spiritual connection of the snake and so they just started associating it with other stories in which males played the primary role or uh in the case of genesis or even in the case of perseus they just destroy or in the case of heracles like heracles kills snakes like um, the Leviathan is defeated by yahweh or, or they destroyed it right or they con not, maybe not destroy but conquered it right um and so if it was a phallic symbol i don't exactly know why they would destroy it or conquer it like there seems to be an interesting i don't know problem there if that was the case um 
but I think they recognize the power of it and the secrets. I think it's the secrets because most snake cults happened in caves or like in the case of Delphi at the bottom of, let's say, a, a temple. There was secrecy around it, right? The snake whispered in the woman's ear, the mysteries. Um, and so I think it's the secret that people want to know, right? And the secret could be dangerous because, for example, in the case of Eve, oh, he told you a secret, which is actually not a lie. The snake told the truth, but the truth is a secret because God didn't want them to know. Because God, you know, the snake says, like, what did God say? You're going to die? And she goes, yeah. And the snake's like, well, you're not going to die. He just doesn't want you to be like that. That's the truth. Yeah, Our truth, truth, but that's the truth. Fiction, yeah. Right? So in a way, it's like the snake held a secret and that secret was powerful. Right? And so who then becomes in charge of secrets? Well, those in charge of the patriarchy, mm -hmm. that affects all of us. Now, no, no matter what gender, if you're not at the top in the serpent worshiping culture, you're not at the top, right? You're among the, you know. I, I don't know. It's, I forget which ancient scripture it is, but in one of these Eden stories, the serp, because the Sethian, the, the, the Sethian Gnostics, they they were Sethians because they revered the son of uh, Seth, which was mm -hmm. the third son of Adam and Eve, I believe. Mm -hmm. And in that story, the serpent and Eve have relations. And mm -hmm. that was the whole thing with Cain and Abel, where I believe it was Cain was of the serpent seed and and that's why when he when god casted him out he went and you know was casted away was was thrown out and 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 to wander the land and continue to do whatever he was going to do that was the serpent seed and you know because she had relations with the serpent in the garden <laughs> Right. I'm, no, I, so I'm just a historian, I'm just, Carla. Don't you shake your head call, at me. You know what I call that one? I call that fan fiction, right? Right. Yes, yes. <laughs> I've heard this too. I've heard this too, Juan. I've heard that that, that division, uh, labeling Cain as a as serpentine, is a is uh, was racially motivated more recently because in history. Gabe, Cain was the one being spoke to by the Lord and not Abel. So what was so special about Cain the whole time? Well, I think this has been used in uh, to essentially prepare people mentally to go and do war against people in the East. Mm -hmm. So Cain mm -hmm. eyes, Cain had... Chinese, he had Cainese, Chinese had cane eyes. He had eyes that were slanted like a cat or a lizard. So oh, that is that is completely racially supercharged. The idea that the division of the bloodlines starts at Cain and Abel is definitely been used to convince people in the past, you got to go kill that guy because his eyes don't look like yours. So Chinese is a biblical slur that English speaking people use to vilify the people of the East. Really? Yes. And there's another one. There's another booby trap just like it. And it happens a little bit later with, with uh, Jacob and Esau. There's another division of bloodlines where people are like, Hey, he's from the bloodline of Jacob. You got to go kill him. You're for, you're with Esau there with Jacob. Sorry. Goes back to your granddaddy's granddaddy. Can't prove it, but it's in this book. So go kill so there's a lot there's a lot of enmity between the seeds woven into the Bible that has been used to fuel uh, battle, war, ignorance, to curtail uh, any conversation, you know, so people can just stop thinking and get to killing. It's the ultimate yeah. propaganda. Yeah. 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 And, and you know, the, and the reason why I call it fan fiction, one, is because it's not in the text itself. It's sort of side mm. tales. And when we get into that stuff, um, I love reading it, but we have to, of course, like Gabe is saying, approach it with what is the intention of these people that are doing the side stories? How is it being used? Then we get into a whole other kind of like 
who is the author of this? What is their purpose? You know, uh, so it doesn't surprise me, like Gabe is saying, that it would have been something to divide people for sure. Um, and it, ironically, again, we're using this idea that it's like a devil seed or a serpent seed, <laughs> and that just because the idea is this. I mean, the reason why I rolled my eyes at your your thing, <laughs> not at you, but at your thing about even the serpent is because that's what they said about witches. You know, fifteen hundred years later. When they were like, the reason we're burning you at the stake is because you have sex with the snake in that night, and you know you have a birthmark where the snake. You got a might... birthmark. <laughs> yeah, like if you had a birthmark on your body in the 12th century Europe, you're fucked. It's so <laughs> it's so bad. That is so bad. So it... bad. Like not like God help you. And you know they used to bathe, right? Like public, not publicly, but not they didn't have private bathrooms. So if somebody saw your child with a birthmark. Uh, and actually, I've been looking up birthmarks lately because I was like, oh, my God, I should almost do a podcast on this. There was so much superstition about birthmarks um, that it's that it's it blows the mind. But certainly, oh. if you, yeah. And if you had a birthmark or if you had or the accusation was always that you had sex with uh, the devil and you made it. And it, the devil always was a snake or a goat. A goat right. Headed, so you, yeah. Yeah. You mm-hmm. know. And so. And I think that, and so that use of the Eve comes from, you know, the book whose name, whose Latin name is not coming to me now, the book that was written against witches by the church. Uh, Mag- the Maleficus Maleficarum. Malleus Maleficarum. That's the right. Witches, witches Hammer. That, which, right. by the way, every judge is still swinging today in every courtroom. What? What is this? That's what the gavel, the gavel is the Malleus Maleficarum. Wait, what year was that <gasps> written? Right, in? Babe. Yes, <gasps> people do not even realize. My mother, oh my she God. loves witches. She's a lawyer. She has no yes. idea. She is pro- she is still a part of the witch you're tribe. Right? You know, I just I just made that connection right now. But yes, you're right. And what that the book fuck? itself, <laughs> that book itself is like like hate propaganda of Eve and of course women, and it's like hate porn. Really, because it's got so much sex, and this is what women must be doing alone in the dark with the devil. They have they have positions, they have mm-hmm. seductions, they have like. And when I read that, it's like, whoa, it's it's a lot. And it was I don't remember exactly when it was written, but it was you know at least 12th century. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know. and they brought it. They it it had its heyday in Germany. Then they brought it. They used it in Europe. Was it a grimoire? And then they shifted. And then they shifted over to America. So it, it could like, be like a grimoire. Yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah. I've never, never yeah. heard about that one, but I, I have read about the, the Sabbath and then when they, what do they do when they go out into the wilderness and the goat-headed man and the the dancing and the different depictions of paintings that have been made of it and the witch's yeah. ointment and all this shit. So, yeah, yeah and definitely. Then I'll, I'll put one more seed in everybody's mind. Just no, don't put any seeds in me. About, <laughs> oh, man, get ready. Get ready. <laughs> so... Uh, Nietzsche, Nietzsche. Uh-huh. He is notoriously um, uh, they're, they're metaphorically uh, connected to the hammer. They often talk about Nietzsche chipping away at the infrastructure of civilization. It's, he's got a hammer to smash your paradigms. He's always wearing a hammer. And I just want to point out that the uh, nihilism is a very destructive force. It will shatter your paradigms. Maybe you need that. But I associate that with the witch's hammer in an even more obscure way, but it, it resonates very strongly. And so the, the, whole, the whole thing about the hammer is just something to be weary of. It is something to really think twice of what the cultural implications are to the hammer. Is yeah. that why Thor has a hammer? Now all hammers are bad, Gabe? I think Thor is a representation of Nietzsche. Yeah, uh, I have a whole weave on that. Where of all of Frederick Nietzsche? You got it, man. All I could do almost all the characters in the uh in the You mean uh, Thor Marvel. the comic book, though. That's yes. what you mean. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so almost all the Marvel Avengers characters uh mm-hmm. have a real uh true historian or philosopher that you can connect them to. So they are the living archetype of actual historical characters. So you got it. They're collecting all of that. Yeah. In, uh, I mean, I could do a whole hour on Diana and uh, wonder woman. 
Bingo. I mean, Bingo. Right. That it. I know by heart. The well, others, you know. Speaking yeah. of like archetypes, I mean, Superman is the Ubermensch, which is again back to Nietzsche, where this it was this this man that was so enlightened he could defeat nihilism. You know, like the 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 hero, the 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 hero to the antihero. I guess who would be the nihilistic? I mean. What do you have for the other side of things? Because I mean, you have so, like Loki. Well, I, guess. I mean, like the uh, the the opposite of like the Ubermensch, where the 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 guy that fell into the abyss. Who would that be? I mean, would that be Mephisto? Uh, spider, Spider. So Spider Man represents uh, Carl Jung, and yeah. Carl Jung was answering the philosophical conundrums that Nietzsche just launched on the world carelessly. Uh, and Carl Jung had to come and clean it all up. Um, so that's and weave it all together. Weave it all together to mend the wound with the collective web of consciousness. Oh, yeah. yeah, and we see the connection with Nietzsche and Freud. We know the connection there. He was having relations with his with Nietzsche's lady friend. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. so then again, yeah, that that would make a lot of sense because he took Freud's work and was like, hey, this doesn't work throw it out and then form a completely different system to where it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Cause I think mm-hmm. Freud just wanted to have sex with his mom. That, that was what he was all about. Like <laughs> some sick perverted guy, but it's very interesting. So I never thought about that story about ancient or religious propaganda, because absolutely. If you look back at who wrote it and for what reason or who brought up the idea, that would make perfect sense that if it was, a sect of people that was against another group of people. And we, and yesterday I spoke to Lumpkin about this, about how religion at the end of the day, he talked about that we will eventually go into another axial age where it's going to be a shift in paradigm and we'll, where we're going to throw out religion. And when we understand religion, when we understand our true powers, which is, this is what we've always talked about, about, you know, we're talking about the Kundalini, we're talking about the serpent, what's the secret, all this stuff. And when, once we figure out the true nature of our power, you know, and, and using, you know, methods of divination, like tarot and all this other shit, those are, he called them crutches in order Mm -hmm. to, to, they're crutches in order for you to have that power that you already have without needing to use any form of divination or, any help from an exterior source, you know, magic. We're able to do that without the ceremonies and all this shit. But there's been a shift somewhere in history, in human history and consciousness, where they've, again, knocked us off that horse. And I've always said this, where I do believe that back then, I believe that the world was like a Harry Potter, where it was, everything was magical, where everything manifested real time. And, you know, people were able to, do sorcery and stuff. I mean, uh, look, at, one of my favorite stories is when I think it was Edward Kelly read something that one of the angel, he read something and then an angel came out and was beating him with shovels. And then John D comes out and banishes the angel with a, with, with a wand. <laughs> <laughs> he was getting beat by an angelic being with a shovel. Just like, you know, again, an allegory of don't, you know, maybe if he was being attacked by a poltergeist, who knows? But don't fuck with the occult. I mean, if you don't understand it, uh, don't fuck with it because you're going to get beat by an angel with with a shovel. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And I think you're so right, Juan. I mean, for me, especially with my students and with young people nowadays, I see more and more of them, especially with the pandemic, turning towards mysticism. Uh, let's let's yeah, mysticism is a great word. I was going to say astrology, and things, but yes, yes, and they're. And they're really like uh, analyzing and considering and learning. And so, yes, it wouldn't surprise me that we're shifting into a different paradigm. And it wouldn't surprise me that traditional religion, which is really only about 2,000 years old in our existence of, let's say, 100,000 years, if you're into evolution. So it wouldn't surprise me. And when you said that about people using their power, it reminds me of Stonehenge. It reminds me of a lot of mysteries around stones, around the cosmos, right? Um, Lots of stories about magic that even in the Greek world and and secrecy. And so it wouldn't surprise me if the early peoples tapped into, um, look at the ley lines. I mean, they knew about the ley lines 
Yeah. Not that if they did. Of years ago. They absolutely, I believe they absolutely did. I mean, I, I yeah. 100% believe that they absolutely yeah. did, but it was for a higher class. It was for That's the right. shaman class, for the, in right. line, you know, he was the court astrologer to Queen Elizabeth. You know, the, the elites were using this sort of divination and, and magic. Uh, the yeah. pharaohs, that's why, again, the you know, in the movie uh, Apocalypto, what's the whole thing there? Where that shaman, right, the, the high priest, is able to predict when the eclipse is going to come. That's just yeah. science. Yes. That's just astro astronomy. He, he knew when it was going to happen, but he made it to what? Hey, if you guys don't do what I fucking say and sacrifice all these people, I'm going to black out the sun forever. Okay, but mm -hmm. he mm -hmm. knew he was on to the con. The people that weren't were the other people that were down. And you talked about, I relate this to the Oracle of Delphi, where they first they you you know it was very poetic at first. You know the 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 prophecies and everything was very embellished and oh yes. And then they started to add people, you know, uneducated women into the mix. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, yeah, no, this is gonna happen and this is not gonna happen. Yeah. It's like, what, what's you know. You see and the not only that, class. Yeah, and not only that one, now that you say that, the, even in Apocalypto, which I'm not a fan of Mel Gibson's work, but anyway, <laughs> you notice that that was still under patriarchy. That is to say that I believe that pre, so again, we're doing pre-Greek, we're going back more, when we're talking about goddess cultures and goddess serpent cultures, that information might have been more shared. That is, when we look at these early cultures, they were much more circular rather than uh, pyramidical sort of thing, if that's a word, uh, yeah. or hierarchical, right? Mm -hmm. And so by the time we get to the Mayans and to the Aztecs and all that, we're still under, you know, a, a hierarchical kind of patriarchal idea. So that's why those leaders didn't share the knowledge. But yeah. there are scholars who say, you know, way back, let's say 5,000 years ago, 7,000 years ago, the knowledge was tr shared with the tribe. And yes, some people may have been, let's say, better manifestors or better at certain connections, and that was maybe their role. But it wasn't as secret. That's why everyone goes into the cave. Even in the Python Cave of South Africa, that's 8,000 years old, they found that people people went, like the groups of people went into the cave. And so that knowledge might have been shared more, maybe more openly. I mean, we don't know, but... Right. And then as we move forward through time, that knowledge became literal power, like capitalist, maybe not capitalist power, but you know what I mean, hierarchical power. And then it wasn't shared unless maybe you paid your fee at the temple mm -hmm. and then you get to go in. Right. And then that becomes a whole other complicated yep. secret organized society. religion. That's where mm -hmm. mysteries, exactly. mystery religions come from. They're a fucking mystery. So we don't know what they were. I mean, that's the whole thing. The mystery. School. There's a lack of sharing. There's a, there's a hoarding of knowledge of kept spiritual in, knowledge. Yes. Kept in the private, kept on the yeah. private, the secret society side. So I got, I got something I just found today that is mm. really great for where we are right now. Uh, and I'm excited to share it with you. Because it's so Artemisian. Yay. Who's that? Love that word. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Love I'm ready. It. I'm ready if you're ready, Juan. So this is the Serpent Mounds. Oh. And you can see, let's see, let me move this. Oh. Is that in and England can, or somewhere? Where is that at? This is in America. In America. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is the Where? Serpent Mound. I'm pretty sure they're in Ohio. I might be wrong. What? But and just when is... I was thinking, there's no reason to head to Ohio. Yeah, it's a this, shithole, probably. On this trip. I've never <laughs> been. I was like, is there any museum there? But look at this. Is, do you think there's still remnants of this? Oh, yeah. yes. Yes. This uh, this is still up and around. You, it's uh, it's uh, preserved, and you can go and visit. It's just called The Serpent Mounds. I'm... I'm 80% on the Ohio part, but okay. with, I recently learned that there once was an obelisk on the head of the snake and they removed the obelisk and threw it in the river. It's not there anymore. They tried to get rid of it, but it was drawing lightning. It was getting struck by lightning. So the whole thing was getting literally supercharged. It was uh, consummating a relationship with Zeus, you could say. <laughs> <laughs> 
And what made me think of your work, Carla, is look at the arrow, the arrow of Diana. See the arrow shape? Yes. This is her arrow. And it has those three. uh, This could be the top string of the bow. This could be the bottom string of the bow. And this could be the arrow itself going out this direction. Or you could see it the other direction, the other way that the arrow is pointing to the observer here. Yes, that's kind of the way I envisioned it, yeah. Yes. So this is really profound to me that this is ancient, uh, indigenous American, uh, you know, celestial uh, wisdom preserved in the land. Uh, And it has an echo in other cultures. It rhymes perfectly with another symbol that is, uh, I consider, uh, in a place of, shall we say, less than noble influence. Do you see this symbol here? It's, ups- mm-hmm. it's upside down. This, is that- this is an upside down Jesuit logo. Are you showing it, me the arrow there? You see the arrow. It has the exact same Artemisian arrow this is also sagittarian this is the arrow of sagittarius you see the sign for sagittarius very interesting and furthermore just to make things even more complicated uh so you gotta it's pointing at the five and the four which makes a nine up here interestingly enough uh but (laughs) this is the she viper s-h-i Viper, there is generally on the hangman symbol, this upside down cross, which is the cross of St. Peter. Uh, in the hangman card, there's a serpent is often hanging out on the H, that making it a she and a viper. And I am quite convinced, Carla, that the Jesuits are worshiping uh, Medusa, the she viper, the Vatica. An ancient, an ancient, ancient system of wisdom that is buried under the, uh, under the Vatican, and it is kept on the down low that they are holding on to a lineage of knowledge that might even predate the Greeks. So it's Ohio, Ohio. Is it? And what does it look like? Right so here, just to culturally confuse everybody, Ohio means good morning in mm-hmm. Japanese. <laughs> Just to really confuse everything. <laughs> Guys, I'm adding it to my USA tour. I think I'm going to take my drone. Yeah. And go see it. That's incredible. That's crazy. It's also really lovely. That it also sense. looks a little bit like a sperm. Yeah. The, and the, the egg right here. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Right? And you said, the, you said the hangman card, Gabe? Yes. Uh, oftentimes, especially, I think the Thoth deck is a... Okay. Yeah. yeah so you can see... The Tau cross up above, he's on a, a cro- that cross beam above is the Tau cross. And then his, his bent knee behind is the crucifix. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so the hangman card, the Crowley Thoth hangman has a real nice, it has oh, the Crowley. serpent. I know, I know. It's got a serpent in, integrated into it. Um, but Also, that's uh, easily an arrow, too. Mm-hmm. That's right. easily a, an arrow. Yes, yes. So that's kind of a something that I stumbled across is the fact that the she viper and the Medusa, she is being venerated by people who I don't necessarily approve of or want to rub elbows with, but she is really proliferated in a major way. It's uh, it's it's quite profound that it goes un, unseen because now that I see it. It is everywhere I look. It's really wild. In another aspect of that, you noticed in the Jesuit logo, it's got the spines, the, the, the different types of light beaming in all directions. Mm-hmm. And I know you, you are aware of this, but another name for the she-viper is the echidna. Mm-hmm. And the, That's right. Uh, yes. And the echidna <laughs> is the scientific name for the porcupine. And the porcupine has spines, needles, pokey things going in all directions. And its name, Echidna, um, when you look it up, it is the missing link 
between mammal and reptile. It is the genetic missing link between humans and reptiles. And the last three letters in the word echidna, D-N-A. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah, bro. <laughs> yeah, bro. Game okay. has thrown us Hold down on. the rabbit hole. Give me, give me a second. I've got curveballs for days. Give me a second to to collect my thoughts because I'm reading a I'm reading a conspiracy about this serpent mound, and then you're fu- I'm hearing you over here. I'm like, what the fuck is Gabe saying? So you're saying that the porcupine is the missing link between the genetic missing link of humans and the snakes, mammals, and reptiles meet. It's the it's the one genus where they come together is in the porcupine. What now, the fuck? so the porcupine the is half fuck? reptile, half half mammal. Because yep, yeah, because it um, it I believe it has to do with how it the babies how it uh, produces babies how they just <laughs> Yes, this is some weird, creepy shit, bro. Are we? Are we? Hold on, bro. I'm... You guys, hold on. You guys, really? Let's do it. Let's go the distance. Let's really freak people out. The Maxwell family crest. Gislaine, Gislaine Maxwell. Does it have the a Hiss, porcupine? The Hiss Lion Maxwell family crest no. has a porcupine dead center of a mutable black X. So, all right. Hold on. Show me an image. Does anyone have anything? I'm going to pull one up, but let me get okay. something off my chest because okay. Gabe. I, yeah, bro. Is, <laughs> is a hedgehog part of the porcupine family? I think so. I think yes. they're in there too. Yes, it is. You're going to start seeing it everywhere. Everything's going to start making sense, man. It's all Jesuit heraldry. That's what's a trip. That's, what the, that's the big capture. They've captured Medusa. And they're using the symbol mm-hmm. to strike fear in the hearts of those who even observe it. It uh, it's, it pours your cup with pain to look at it. Pour Q pine. It pours your cup full of pain just to think about how the hell is Perseus even holding that thing? Mm-hmm. Like he's holding Medusa by the snakes. The snake, that doesn't make any sense. You know, like how is he even apprehending the head of Medusa? So it's quite the Maxwell family crest. Yes. I have one. If you want me to pull it up. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm it seeing is... here. The I'm seeing some weird shit, but you can pull it up here. Yeah. And it is also, I mean, I know I'm throwing a lot on the table all at once because I got a lot to offer, but it's also the Starbucks logo. The yes. Starbucks logo is yes. is an echidna. It is the she viper. Yes. It is the Medusa. And then I'm gonna yes. uh let's see. Is it Medusa? And That's I one thing I wish I would have put in my snake in my snake thing. Usually I do like oh. a modern connection and I did not that's one thing I wish I would have put in my uh, Snake Mother's podcast. Yes, absolutely. I, I could totally give you all kinds of fuel for that. So, hey, shout out to the Demiurge. Yeah, buddy. So here we have, is is it Gislaine? Is her name Gislaine or is the G silent? Is it a hiss lion? The hissing lion. Hmm. And notice that we have a crown of thorns. It has the porcupine. Mm-hmm. It has those spines up above. And when you put a moon and a star together, you get a moon star. This is the monster. This is the monster of the Demiurge. I think it also has much to do with the uh, actual god of uh, Islam. And Gabe, why would the – so when I look at this painting or picture or whatever, and, I, and even the other one that you showed me of the Jesuits, why would it not be sunlight or halo light or like Helios or mm. Mithras? Yes, okay, okay. This, this is so far out. I believe <laughs> – One is like <laughs> – I'm, I'm fucking – right now I'm just like, hold on, hold on. What the fuck? <laughs> I'm just fucking... 
I'm just oh my, God. my mind is you, my mind is fucking barbecued <laughs> right now, bro. I don't even know what to do. I'm still on the porcupine with the mammals thing. And I'm trying to relate that to marsupials. Where did the marsupials fall in here, bro? It is it is something to even ponder. I believe that the uh, your question about why is it not sunlight? I believe that the reason is the the, the big secret is that they're. Um, they are masters of alchemy. They have uh, many forms of hallucinogenics on offer. And so it, they are encoding an internal light, the, an inner light that is stimulated by partic- partaking of a communion, uh, uh, probably considered sacred to them, a sacred communion. And so it turns the lights on internally in your mind. And that's what I think that crown of light is really talking about. And um, pr- personally, when uh, I when I was younger, I used to uh, ritualistically partake in uh, the Holy Trinity of the uh, the uh, the Chillum Sacrament, and the Chillum is a cross of uh, marijuana, tobacco, and hash. And, like when, and when you, oh man. Beautiful, beautiful ceremonies. Uh, But when you commune with the Holy Trinity of those three, I literally can feel pins and needles inside my skin as the tobacco is attaching to all of my blood, my hemoglobin. And as it attaches, I feel pinpricks cover my body, uh, almost like I'm transmorphing into a porcupine. Uh, So that is what the best I can do to try to uh, elucidate on that crown of light, the mm-hmm. internal light. Uh, so I want to. Okay, hold on. I know, man. I know. I'm trying to. Uh, as, as oh, we... same thing. Same thing when you drink coffee. When you drink coffee, it turns your lights on. So have Starbucks having this sacred communion, being the master alchemists that make the mix just right. Do you want it steamed with cream or soy? And then you take that sip and your light turns on and it's, it's morning time. Let's get to work. Let's go say yes to everything that is on offer in the world. So I've, I've dubbed this idea porcupine theory. Okay. Nice. And, All right. And this is, okay. So I'm curious cause we're talking about deities that these people, the, the elite are worshiping. Now I'd be curious to what Carla has to say about, the cults to Medusa, what sort of practices did they partake in? What sort of rituals did they do? What sort of things did they, did they, you know, to honor Medusa, Med USA? So, okay. There is no actual cult to Medusa in the Greek, like pantheon or the Greek mythology. There's no temple to her. There's no... Uh, what do you call it? There's no text to her. There's nothing. Interestingly, though, Medusa's head, like I said, is an aspect or a symbol of protection. And so we see that inside Greek homes, inside uh, on top of stoves. On the, so it's uh, I wouldn't say that's a cult, but I would because it's not an organized religion or an organized uh, group or community. But I would say that people used her as a symbol of protection. So I think more the Pythia, I think more like other, even the Vipers, they had, I don't know if I would say they had, it depends if you're talking about the Greeks. If you're talking about the Greeks, I don't think that they really were, unless it was a mystery cult that we don't have much, too much data about. They were in the caves, maybe. Huh? Right? Um, so I, in Crete, for example, the snake goddess or the snake priestess, that she was the leader of worship and at the same time, I guess also being worshiped. Uh, so that's one example of like a divine snake worship, but Medusa, by the time she made it to the Greeks, you know, she was, um, a scary story. And so they don't have anything erected to her that they would officially say, well, this is a cult to her. So we don't actually have, I'm trying to think of, yeah. Okay. Pull it up. Let's let's 
say what you've got. It's in here. And so what, like, what, oh, you've got stuff in there. Um, because I think this is what I mean. The dates are important. Like, when do these things take place? Um, and who is worshiping and where? So that kind of stuff, I think, is is we have to take into consideration. But as far as a Medusa, an official Medusa cult, there is no record of one in Greek mythology or Greek history. So, like, I, what, I, yeah, I would I would accuse the Jesuits of of holding that mantle. Yeah. So if we're talking mm-hmm. about later serpent, like, so if we're talking about adaptation of serpent worship, not uh-huh. Medusa officially, but let's say serpent worship by Christians and perhaps other religions moving forward in time, I could see that happening. Mm. But again, it's unofficial, right? So it's and secret yeah. and mysterious. It's, totally. And it's it's so esoteric, though, that image of mm-hmm. the head with the serpents. Like, that's so weird. So mm-hmm. this is my idea, because we can talk about, shit, I mean, Tiamat, you know, when, when, it, was, when it was slayed and, and the, the body parts became everything that we know today you know mm-hmm. the the universe and the world and, and whatnot but this idea of a head you have hercules uh fighting the hydra right the mm-hmm. cut the head off a new one grows in medusa's head that turns things to stone the ancient egyptian belief that if you had the head of a prophet it would prophesize to you and we know mm-hmm. where that leads to it leads to baphomet the head of John the Baptist. Now, Mm -hmm. I stumbled across some interesting information with an individual who sometimes, the bad thing about him is he's super, super smart. But one of the bad things about him is that whenever you do an episode with him, it's like playing rapid fire questions. And he's so smart that he just says these things and doesn't know. Sometimes we don't go into it. And we were talking about just that Baphomet and this idea that, you know, the Knights Templar were using this to as a, as a source of divination. And he said to me something about skull and bones, which I found interesting because again, back to the head symbolism, back to Geronimo, the head of the skull of Geronimo, the skull of Rene Descartes was missing for a long time. They don't know where it was. It was, it's in a private, it was in a private collection for a while. And this, when, uh, you know, Shakespeare, we have Shakespeare, you know, what is it to be or not Ham- to be? Hamlet. Yeah. Hamlet. And mm-hmm. the idea, the reason that these people have, uh, Manly P. Hall allegedly had a copy of, I believe it was the Crowley's Book of the Law and his top drawer at all times. And the reason that he said that he kept that there was because so he could be reminded to how low the human intellect could go. Okay, this is coming from Manly P. Hall, allegedly. And sometimes you see skulls on desks of people, and it's to remind them of how far you can go as a human. So, you know, you could go to, to, to this, you know. And this thing that Andreas Exertus revealed to me was we were talking about crystal skulls and, and swapping consciousness, you know, how I, I brought up uh, Elias Artista, which is the immortal alchemist, the Paracelsian uh, uh, Elias Artista, which is, again, it could be a, a pseudonym for salt, right? Uh, or it could be this uh, this ascended master, this alchemist that has figured out that the, the true philosopher's stone and he exists outside the fabric of space and time. And I've had this theory for a while now where I believe these alchemists of old, they figured out the secret to immortal life. And it's not what we think it to be. I think it's more of a spiritual type of thing, metaphysical type of thing. Anyways, back to the the brotherhood of death or skull and bones, you know, 322. Headhunters. The headhunters. Now, this idea of having the head of a, an indigenous person back then uh, almost as a trophy either for for power or not who knows but allegedly according to exertus there was a ritual that the skull and bones do where one of their members before they die they ingest certain uh, maybe a hallucinogenic cocktail of some sorts and they hold a skull and the reason for that is to transfer 
their consciousness or their knowledge into that skull before they part away from this realm. Now, again, back to Medusa. What's Medusa all about? About turning people to stone? I'm trying to weave this in somewhere or another to that type I, of belief. I think, you know, and I actually, I think what you've drawn there is perhaps a difference between almost the, the, the divine feminine and the patriarchy in the sense that Medusa is a living being. Let's connect that to the divine feminine of birth and rebirth and life. The snakes are on her living head. So if the snakes represent knowledge, obviously is on her head. Knowledge is living. Where I think the example that you're giving about the skull, there's something again, almost like Yahweh like, and I don't want to say masculine because it's not fair, but the idea that like you're breathing the knowledge into something that's already kind of dead and it holds it. There's something Yes. Mechanical, I don't know the, the word OG for it. USB drive is what I called it. Right, right, right. Oh, and me. where, so it's almost like we're having a discussion between a living, a breathing divinity and divine culture of the ancients and a more static, private, secret uh, sharing of knowledge of our modern culture. That's kind of how what I see. Esoteric, yeah. yeah nice. When you're saying that, I think. So I think I think there is a connection there that the idea of knowledge and head and and sharing and things like that. But I think that the the line there is between living, breathing, birthing, whatever it is, yeah. and a private, secret, almost kind of difficult a because, bit because of the skull yes, and stuff. Yes. If you think about it, whenever somebody kills a snake, what do they always do? I don't know. They always know. Chop, the chop the head off. Mm, they always chop yeah. the head off and the head is still if it's a poisonous snake it could still kill you while yes, it's a true. detached from the body so again mm -hmm. this idea of decapitation of the snake you know uh the the killing of the snakes in ireland right saint patrick's day we know mm. what that was about about eliminating the serpents mm. killing the serpents so oh, yeah. Again, I don't know where, again, this is just ideas I'm throwing out there because I find it I very got, interesting. We're, I'm trying to find the I source. Got a lot. I got a lot. I got a lot. I got a whole lot. <laughs> so, so the pole star is like an iris. It's the only star that doesn't move. It's stationary. It's a stone. It's unmoving. It's uh, recumbent. It's, uh, it's, it's the center of the eye. Uh, and around that is Hydra. So to kill the serpents in Ireland would be to slay the Hydra that is looming around the that focal point, that North Star. Also, the ritual of putting your essence into a skull, much like you said, uh, that it's like a cup or a chalice. It's a trophy. Atrophy is to become like stone. The skull is a trophy, and also Aphrodite. Um, and, well, it's I just also, had an idea, Gabe. Okay, I'm writing it down. Yep. So okay. you're filling that cup with, from your vessel into that vessel. Around the North Star, there are two vessels, two cups: the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. Each one of the dippers have seven stars. The skull has seven holes. And so you're pouring your essence out of the the fresh, the the youngest, and pouring it into something that is the oldest as an offering. And so you have the seven, the skull has the seven. Those are the two dippers, the big dipper and the little dipper that are surrounded, that are spiraling around the iris, uh, which Ireland is northernly oriented. So it definitely has that. And also, uh, Eris is the goddess of chaos, and that's the IRS watching you from... <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome, Gabe. Actually, you gave me two ideas. First of all, my the, this week's uh, podcast, and I know this is going to be airing late, but anyway, this week's podcast is the Hydra, Scylla, and uh, Charybdis. So, or Charybdis. And so... 
I like this idea that actually with the Hydra, the more you cut off the heads, the more heads grow back. So again, this is a living piece of knowledge, right? The other, of course, Hercules eventually figures it out. But anyway, um, the other thing that's interesting when you're talking about the skull, when I was thinking of when you were just saying putting your essence of the skull, uh, your essence into the skull, it's another way of like Yahweh birthing and rebirthing without the use of the female body. Oh, sweet. Right? Like in a sense, it's like in the secret cult, which is like the masculine or brother cult, like the skull cults, instead of using a natural way of rebirth, you are pouring your essence into this cup. Homunculus. And, right? And then this cup, I guess whatever they do with it to rebirth you in some way, but it is not like the organic natural way of birthing. It's it's above, let's say it's, you know, supernatural. It's, mm-hmm. it's fascinating. That, and it's interesting that you fill the vessel, which in a way is also the way that ancient, ancient people described sex, where, you fill the womb, right? Like you're, it's interesting that now the womb becomes the skull, right? Anyways, and if, and yes. if you I was look going at down a, that rabbit hole with you. <laughs> if you like, look whoa. at the ovaries, it looks like a fucking head of Baphomet. Absolutely. Right? Right? <laughs> <laughs> nice, well, man. And nice. I wanted to, to add, because you, you mentioned Hercules, isn't Hercules the one that rescues Prometheus? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, he releases him from the vulture eating his kidney. Yeah, over and over. A liver, liver, sorry, liver. liver. Yeah, That's the, right. The, the, again, yeah. the, the, was it a vulture or was it a crow? Or was it, a, think, was it an eagle? It was a no. herpes. It was herpes. Uh, is it? Oh, I think that, it's a vulture. Well, I think they, it varies, but it's vulture, yeah. herpes, and maybe eagle in some cultures. Oh, what yeah. would you say again? On... A harpy or a herpy? A harpy. Harpy, thank you. <laughs> Harpies. <laughs> Because herpes get the same reputation. They keep coming back. Yeah, the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> They're perpetual. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, so, that's amazing. You know. I have, go ahead, Ron. No, go ahead. I wanted to I wanted to add real quick because, you know, we're talking about the skull and the brain. The Greeks, right? The Greeks believed the human brain was nine twelfths of a circle. So, again, back to the number nine. Nine twelfths of a circle. So wow, that is interesting. Nice. Well, uh, so I had another kind of fun realization today. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, to add real quick, that yeah. that snake mound that you pointed out, apparently, allegedly, there are bodies that are buried underneath. That those mounds and there's a conspiracy as to why but they're near their their burial mounds and they're apparently there was human remains there so they were burying people there um, so again very interesting excavation and radiocarbon dating done in the 1990s proved that the serpent mound to be a younger than the burial mound and indicates that the builders of the serpent serpent could have adapted the existing burial site to their own uses so somebody thought it was sacred enough to bury their dead there. That's interesting. It really is a vessel, uh, a container uh, full of pain. Literally. Or, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it also matches the serpent, the idea that the serpent is uh, life and death. And so it would make sense if you believe that, or, or immortality, a symbol of immortality, that you right. might want to bury your dead in a place where they might find immortality. Is, yes. is the Ouroboros consuming itself or throwing itself back out well that's a tough one um i would say that in some in modern like secret cults there and then even in some of the films like i watched uh, hemlock grove for example there was this idea that it's a kind of a harbinger of evil that there is a consuming of itself and that there's something like negative or demonic about it but I would say um, in the ancient world, it was more of continued, more immortality, more mystery, I would say, rather than demonic assumption. Because if, it if it's throwing itself back out, that could, that could hint at the fact that the serpent creates reality. It's creating itself if it's mm-hmm. throwing itself back out. And the Ouroboros is a very, very unique sign. And I was talking to Gabe where... 
I want to do a, a a a series on Survivor or an episode on Survivor because the, one of the things and I'm tr I was trying to find it while you guys were talking. There's this idea when you would hang a serpent around your neck that you would it was a symbol of enlightenment or something like that. I couldn't find it. And in the show Survivor, they literally have the sign of the Ouroboros. So I'm going to pull it up that they hang around people's, you know, when they're immune, when they have immunity. I don't know if you guys ever watched Survivor. Yeah, I used to watch that show all the time. So they they give them a talisman of immunity. Yeah, dude, and that that oh, it's an Ouroboros, and it's an oh, Ouroboros. I'm gonna pull it up, and the the Yao the the Demi Urge picture that you that you pulled up, those were actually talismans that the Gnostics used. They they would put a Braxis on it, they would put a Braxis right here. You see him right here. They would put yep. a Braxis on the talismans as again how uh, what Carl was saying about these these protection right these little pendants of protection. They would use talismans. They were doing talismanic magic. Uh, as forms of protection or divination or some sort of thing where they did believe that it had some sort of power. I'm going to pull this up real quick so we can wrap the, up on this because we're always trying to, whenever I get together with Gabe, we're always trying to fucking decode some sort of mystery cult fucking plan to rule and take over the world. I don't know. Everything at yeah, once, yeah. basically. <laughs> yeah, pretty fucking It's interesting. Much. Yeah, yeah. I like the idea of a talisman of immunity uh, because that is has been marketed in a very modern context as uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci uh, made that claim that the mask is a talisman, that it's a... a what? Yeah, that's like we've, we've completely fetishized, fetishized health. And when he called a mask a talisman early on in the first waves... He called it a talisman, uh, which is uh, so accurate. That's probably the truest thing he ever said. What the fuck? I did not know this, <laughs> but this got a lot more interesting because apparently the talismans, the the necklaces for immunity ha have changed every single season. So That I thought as well, yes. The, the newest season, because the only season I had ever seen of the show was season 42. And I'm seeing some occultic shit right here where it almost looks like some sort wow. of of like Mayan looking. Yeah, because I think they use the place where they are as inspiration for all the talismans. So it'd be interesting to see where they were when they used the snake as a talisman. Yeah. In the yeah. In Fiji, in I the, believe, is where the they were. Fiji. In Fiji? Fiji? Yeah, they're in Fiji. Yeah. When they use the oh the whole time the whole show is in Fiji. Yeah, the the f season forty one and forty two is in mm -hmm. Fiji. I mm. believe it was Fiji. I'm pretty sure it was Fiji. That's interesting. I wonder if they say why they chose that talisman. I don't know. I'm That's trying to find it I... here. Let me find it so, real quick. Do your thing, Gabe. Well, uh, Fiji brings to mind uh, uh, the original, the first. Uh, uh, art in uh, uh, Japan that was prints that were like block print that they would basically take the uh, carving and soak it in the paints and then stamp it onto um, the canvas. And that artist was uh, Katsushi Kahokusai was the first uh, prince and his series that he did was called Portraits of Fiji. And so that kind of immortalizes that mountain and that location in the masses, in the collective. It puts it, uh, stamps it in time. Um, and everybody knows that. I almost wore that shirt today. It's got a, the waves washing over these fellas who are bundled up in the boats, and they're all, like, hunkered down, and the wave looks like it's about to wash over them. Uh, so that comes to mind because they're fighting for their life. They're fighting for survival. So it's strangely appropriate that they put the word Fiji in the minds of the masses in this context of survival. I love that art. Yeah, and they have they also have the chariot card on there. And then I was asking you about the balancing acts that they always do. They always do balancing acts of like they have to. Right. Hold. There was a pose in particular in one of the episodes where they were literally on a cross. They were holding on like this with the two feet yes. together. And again, yes. it's been one of the longest running shows of all time more than 20 years 
So I'm going to actually pull it up from the actual show itself because I can't find a, uh, a picture online of, of it. But I'm going to share my screen here in a second. So you got here they we do. go right here. So check this they out. They do a few of those. And I think they're like based on actually some of them are even based on like torture, like lightly based on like old torture techniques, uh, European torture techniques. Yes. And fans do submit like different whatever. So here it is. This is ideas. The, this is the immunity. Oh, can you guys see that? Yeah, yeah. This is the immunity idol. Oh, so oh, I, no, see sorry, a, we don't, I see a yeah, black screen. Same. You guys can't see that shit. Oh man, I'm gonna hold on. Let me take a a, a, a screenshot of it. Hold on. So you guys see that? Yeah. Oh yeah. So wow. it's the, oh, So let wow. me take a screenshot of it because this is crazy. Hold on. That's in Fiji. That's yeah. fascinating. Uh, uh, allegedly, it's in Fiji, but let me pull this up because. Oh, I guess it's not letting me. Oh, in. guess what? Immunity Idol is I I. That's two nines. That's a yin yang. Wow. I I. That's two serpents. Tef tef. Wow, it's, and this is crazy. I'm trying to paste it on a paint, and it doesn't come through. It's black again. Oh. It's immune. It's immune to your wiles, Juan. <laughs> It does not let me repost it. it Anyways, it has, it, it you guys see it there, right? It's it's the Ouroboros right there. Yes, I'm just looking up why they're using it. Uh huh. And then when they win it, when they win it, they get this necklace around their necks that they put on. Mm -hmm. Let me find it. Where they literally, they get. There's another one that goes around their necks. Anyways, I can't find it, but and they basically it gives them the I'm rubber and you're glue, and it gives charm. them it gives them an immunity from being able to get kicked off of the that's the right show. protection. It's protection. Mm -hmm. Yes, nice. Right? I find it. Anyways, that, I found that very interesting that they would use some sh sort of thing like that, and then obviously we're on the topic of the serpent, and then I, I I'm, I'm sure I read it in one of those books that I had pulled up. Where the, you know, putting an actual serpent on you was a sign of, you know, uh, of enlightenment or whatever mm -hmm. it was. I'm, uh, once I find out, I'll pull it back up. But Well, that brings us back to full circle. We were talking about how divine feminine goddesses or priestesses would have snakes on them, on mm -hmm. their heads, on their arms, on their bodies. Alexander's mother, was it? Uh, Alexander, yes. She would sleep That's with right. the serpents. And That's yeah. right. She slept with the serpents. Enough mm -hmm. that her husband said, uh, at first he thought it was sexy, and then he was like, dude, this is freaking me out. Wait, this is uh, because nasty. he didn't trust the snakes. But also it's fascinating to me because she slept with the snakes. And then, of course, Cleopatra, which is, I think, five generations later or four generations later, is also a snake master. Um, Look at the difference. Right? Look at the different immunity idols, necklaces that they have put out throughout the seasons. There's a bunch of different ones. Yeah. It's not just the Ouroboros. There's one with a snake on it yeah. from this newest season. But they have all sorts of of immunity idols that they have put on the show. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so so this definitely brings me to the Analima uh, because of the hanging around the neck. Because it, uh, and we're talking about decapitation. We're mm -hmm. talking about headhunters, and um, so I've got a graphic I'd love to share. Let's see that um, the Analima is uh, if you go out and take a picture of the sun from the same location every day for 365 days, you'll get this figure eight in the sky, and. It, and I can I call it the Ak Alt. It's the highest alt there is. Let's see. Here we go. So this is the Ak Alt. Hmm. This is the highest alt in the sky. And uh, we could get into what that build. Do you recognize that building by chance, Carla? <laughs> this is was yeah. forever yeah. ago, bro. <laughs> It might be an Athena temple, right? Maybe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So right here at the X, we when we are A T the X, we pay the T A X. Right here at four fifteen, and that is we are entering the temple. We are going. Uh, so you can see my mouse. We're rising up to the pinnacle, towards the pinnacle. We are entering into the temple 
of Hawthorne. We are Hawthorized to go into the season of May, which is uh, the sign of the bull. Um, and you could you could contemplate the Jesus flipping the tables on the money changers as he was entering the temple, and there were signs of the bull on the money that pissed him off, and he flipped that table. Well, this whole thing gets flipped. The whole Analima flips uh, and comes back down and descends right here and crosses again at August 27th, which is Vulcanalia. And Vulcan is Hephaestus, is the god of the forge, the vo- god of the uh, coins, Yahweh. the coin, the metallurgy. Mm-hmm. So this X location is highly sacred. It also marks the beginning of Passover. But this would be where, if you were wearing a necklace, it would be in this location. The charm of protective uh, value would be here at the neck. And guess what happens in the Bible? Guess what happens on August 29th, I think, just a couple days after the X? That's when John the Baptist lost his head. Chop, chop, motherfucker. Yeah, this is on the August. So on the rise is the day that Abraham Lincoln sent out the uh, the the soldiers to initiate the Civil War. It's also the day years later that he was shot in the head. Whoa. Uh, it's also the day that the Titanic sank. There are so many events that have happened on this X marks the spot on the Analima. It's out of control. And so all of this decapitation, the uh, the necklace, even su- uh, suffocating uh, and uh, being strangled, choked, or unable to speak, all these aspects are centered in this location. You could think of this as the uh, da'at, the duat uh, of the tree of life. And one more thing before we go, because this is this went fucking nowhere. I thought it was gonna go. It's crazy. It just went like insane. But hey, who is on the ground here? Is this what we're talking about here? The the death card with all those heads yes. on the ground. Chop chop. All the heads of state. King yes. kill thirty three. Right, the king is dead. Yes. This card takes place uh, on with the sign of Oki, Ophiuchus, the serpent charmer. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Ophiuchus. That isn't yeah. he the missing zodiac sign? Isn't he the hidden the thirteenth zodiac sign? He is. The one yes. plus three he- equals four. The number four is the demiurge's number. Formation. Nice. Also, when you unfold the the cube, it turns into a cross. It's the the, the yeah. number of materiality. That's what the cross symbolizes. It's fucking, this has been amazing. And, and that's the day that JFK was assassinated. The very first day of Ophiuchus really? was the day that the king fell to the ground. Was the death was when the death card was played. Uh, very, very significant. Uh, no, November 22nd. Wow. And it only lasts five days because it's uh, only five degrees of the, of the, um, of the Zodiac that he's touching. And then I got one more thing I'd love to drop. I mean, just for hanging chads, so we get all the hanging chads. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we'll end it on that. Okay, this is the last one. This is really far out. I'm starting to, um, I'm starting to really focus on the 19th tarot card, which is the Sun card, and it is in the sign of Aries, where Perseus resides. So to be very technical uh, and without going too in-depth, the number 19, the sun card, corresponds with Perseus. It is the location where the head of Medusa is to be found. And it has that star, that Algol star. Uh, A-L-G-O-L, the Algol star, is the eye of Ares, the goddess of chaos. And it's considered like the evil star. And the last time we talked, Mercury had moonwalked backwards and was sitting on top of the evil eye when we had our conversation last. And I've really been meditating on that. The fact that the eye of evil is on the card number 19. We just had COVID-19, right? (laughs) 
very, very interesting. A lot of people were paralyzed uh, just from the idea of what that Corona sun, Corona, the sun card, what that meant to them uh, psychologically. But there's something even more significant to think about. And uh, there, there's so much more to say, but I'm just going to give you guys the highlights. 19 was the amendment that gave women the right to vote. The 19th Amendment in the 19th Tarot card have a lot to think about in the fact that Medusa, the decapitation of Medusa, uh, is, is immortalized forever in that location and uh, connected to the number 19 intrinsically. Uh, and I'm starting to think of it as uh, that voting is like a voting, a, a votive offering. A votive offering is when you go and uh, put something up to the gods in hope of get, uh, receiving favor, in hope that they'll give you your wishes, the things you want. That's what a vote is. That's what the process of voting is. You put this little piece of paper in a special place, a sanctified location, and you hope that the gods will give you your, what you want. You hope that you have gained some sort of sway in the outcomes of future events. So there's a lot more to what I just said, but I just wanted to show the highlights that 19, Medusa, the sun card, and the women's right to vote are connected, and there's a lot of psychological potence behind sussing out what that really means. Uh, you could say it's a declaration of war against women, bringing them onto the battlefield, inviting them into the arena, the public arena mm -hmm. of the battlefield. You could say that, that the women were initiated into the public uh, on that uh, fateful event. Yeah, absolutely. It is a slap in the face to women. And remember, they gave Bruce Jenner woman of the year and she was apparently the bravest woman ever it's like that's a slap to the face of the actual brave women out there who again are, act are actual women so i think that's part of uh by design again what you're saying this perversion of what is a biological woman they don't even can't even prove that anymore this has been yeah. fucking great guys okay and and yeah it's definitely been yeah and <laughs> It's definitely been interesting. Like, wow, the connections are quite fascinating. You want to share you guys' stuff, Gabe? You go first, and we'll let Carla go after you. Share your, your <laughs> socials, and people can go and find you. Yeah, yeah. I'm on uh, Slick Dissident on YouTube. That's pretty much where I do my thing. Uh, you catch me on the Weaving Spiders Welcome. Uh, we also run under Weaving Spiders Webs. It's our alias, and I am uh, get down with Chance Garten over on Interverse every once in a while. Uh, and that's about it. You can find uh, Interverse on Rockfin is the best way to go. That's me. Mm, okay. Um, you can find me at The Goddess Project on YouTube or Instagram and at Artemis Expert everywhere else. And um, I'm also starting this Artemis Research Center. Um which is right now a website, but eventually I want it to be an actual physical space where we can do retreats, conversations, lectures, maybe some collections, books, and I don't know. I have this great vision board full of uh, things that we're going to do at the center. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And your book of the... And my book, She Who Hunts. Yay! Find that on Amazon. I'll post the link yeah. in the description. Yeah. Yes, oh. and hopefully you guys will follow me on my on my motorcycle trip. Uh, I'm gonna post a bunch of stuff everywhere of all the things I want to see because there's like like we've just talked about. There's some incredible things that uh, I just want to see firsthand and also photograph firsthand because I don't always trust photographs on Google. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, in our own backyard, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. I had a lot of fun. This was great. We should do it again very soon. We'll figure something yes. out to do next. And how, see yeah. how we can continue this, this and make it into a trilogy or something. We'll see what happens. I feel like we should definitely do the Sphinx or something, guys. Because we were okay. talking about that game before. Oh, yeah. that's right. I'll, I didn't bring that one up. I'll, we'll sit on it for next time. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, do, yeah. we'll do the Sphinx because I have some uh, initiation. Of the 
the initiation of the pyramids and whatnot. Yeah, we can definitely get into that. So, yeah. Yeah. well, thank you so much, guys, for coming on and. and